Have you ever seen ripples on the beach? It doesn't take much to imagine that these ripples are created by waves and tides as they roll over the shoreline. Ripples and sand dunes both form through natural forces that transport sediment grains over great distances. These natural forces, including moving water and wind, affect how sediment is ultimately deposited in the environment where it will become sedimentary rock. We can observe the direct consequences of these natural forces in the form of sedimentary structures. Sedimentary structures are large, visible, three-dimensional features of sediment and sedimentary rocks created by the processes that affect the sediment prior to lithification. In other words, sedimentary structures are features created by physical and biological processes that affected sediment while it was still soft. Wind and waves are just two of many processes that create sedimentary structures. It's sometimes helpful to distinguish between primary and secondary sedimentary structures. Primary sedimentary structures are created by processes during deposition of sediment. They are created up to the point where the sediment is no longer in motion. In other words, primary sedimentary structures are the direct consequences of the agents of erosion that transport and release sediment at their sites of deposition. Because the processes affect particles that exist prior to deposition, you can only find primary sedimentary structures in clastic rocks and sediments. In contrast, secondary sedimentary structures are features of rocks that are created when processes affect sediment after it has been deposited. Often enough, these structures interrupt the continuity of strata because they distort the sedimentary layers in some way. But we'll come back to secondary structures in a different video. Let's focus now on primary sedimentary structures. With primary structures, it's helpful to differentiate between bedding and bed forms. Bedding, of course, refers to the layers or strata of sediment that build up over time as sediments of different types and textures are deposited on top of each other. When layers of two different lithologies are deposited in alternating thin layers, it's customary to say that the two lithologies are interbedded with each other. And if the layers are horizontal, or were deposited horizontally, we refer to them as plane layers. When it comes to bedding, geologists often distinguish between two types of layers, beds and laminations, or laminae. However, the distinction is somewhat arbitrary. Both reflect the same consequences of sedimentation, just at different scales. Beds are larger than laminations, and you can more easily see them from a distance. A layer is typically called a bed if it is greater than one centimeter thick, but that's just the lower limit. Beds can be several meters in thickness, if not more. Logically then, laminae must be layers that are less than one centimeter in thickness. Because they are so thin, laminations are most commonly found in fine grain rocks like siltstones and shales, which have small grains. That said, sandstone can also be laminated. In theory, there is a continuum of rock layers going from laminae to beds and larger strata. But in practice, it's easy to think of laminations 
as layers within beds. Here, you can see a bed of fine sandstone that contains laminations. Both beds and laminae form when there are changes in the type of sediment that is deposited over time. The layers may reflect changes in the sizes of the grains, their composition, or even the amount of fossils, clays, or organic materials that they contain. The thickness of the level simply reflects the amount of sediment laid down during each depositional event. Bigger events and more dramatic changes in sediment type create beds. Smaller events with more subtle changes create laminae. Depending on how the sediment changes over time, the layers may develop grading. If the youngest beds or laminae have the smallest grains, then we say that the sequence of layers are fining upward. Conversely, if the youngest beds or laminae have the largest grains, then we say that a sequence of layers are coarsening upward. But that's just one type of grading. We can also observe several types of grading within beds. Graded bedding, like this, is a type of primary sedimentary structure where the class within the bed are sorted by grain size. You only find this structure in beds. Laminae are too small for grading. The type of graded bedding that you are most likely to encounter is called normal grading. And if somebody refers to graded bedding, they are usually referring to normal grading. This type of sedimentary structure forms when particles are moving in suspension. The laws of physics tell us that the largest particles have the fastest settling velocities. They fall out of suspension first, followed by smaller and smaller particles until the finest particles settle out of suspension. The end result is a layer of rock with the largest grains on the bottom and the smallest grains on top, normal grading. There are also rocks with reverse grading, but they are very uncommon. This sedimentary structure forms when particles are being transported in a number of ways. In this case, the smallest particles are deposited out of suspension and forces like gravity causes the larger grains to gently be deposited on top of them. They jump and roll on top of the finer grains. In any case, beds and laminae make up various sedimentary structures known as bed forms. Bed forms are sedimentary structures that develop as a consequence of the interaction between a flow and a cohesionless sediment like sand. The flow affects how beds and laminae are actually deposited. A textbook example of a bed form is a sand dune created by wind and airflow. Another textbook example is a current ripple in sand created by moving water flowing in one direction over it. Ocean waves also produce ripples. But for all intents and purposes, all of these things are the same structure, with only ripples and dunes differing in their scale. Sand dunes are measured in meters. Ripples, in contrast, are measured in centimeters. So how do these structures form? Although flowing water and air do move particles through suspension, ripples and dunes are generally formed from sediment moving through traction and saltation. The first step in the formation of these structures is the development of small piles, which grow slowly over time as sand grains roll and jump up the pile of the dune. 
eventually this pile becomes the crest of the structure. The crest is created by the avalanche of sediment down the side of the pile that is upstream of the flow. The sediment grains are moved up the stoff side of the structure, over the crest, and down the lee side or slip face of the structure. A consequence of this process is that ripples and dunes are in a constant state of motion. As long as there is a flow, sediment is scoured from the stoff side and pushed over the crest, piling up on the slip face, which adds to the crest. It then grows in the direction of flow and disappears in the other. This motion leads to the movement of ripples and dunes over time like sand dunes that migrate across the desert. Another important consequence of the avalanches of sediment is that dunes and ripples develop internal layers. Each layer you can imagine represents an avalanche where sediment was deposited at the angle of the slip face. As the structure migrates, the avalanches pile up on top of each other. We call these layers cross beds or cross laminae, depending on their scale. As a rule, dunes are much bigger than ripples, so dunes have cross beds and ripples have cross laminae. Both are examples of cross stratification, which is any layering where sediment or sedimentary rock is oriented at an angle to the depositional horizontal. It is important to recognize that ripples and cross laminations are preserved as sedimentary structures and rocks formed from their sands. The same is also true for dunes and cross beds. It's pretty easy to recognize ripples and sedimentary rocks once you know about them. But it's sometimes difficult for students to make heads or tails of cross stratification. Take these cross beds, for example. They are clearly a sedimentary structure. But what exactly are we looking at here? We must always be mindful of erosion, not just for its role in the deposition of sediment, but also for its role in the destruction of sediment and sedimentary rock features. We must remember that as a dune or ripple migrates, it moves over older structures, and the flow responsible for its movement causes erosion in the process. The flow erodes the crests of older dunes and ripples, leaving only their laminations. So in a sequence like this one, you are seeing all the times when flows eroded away the crests of the dunes. Cross beds bounded by horizontal surfaces like this one are called tabular crossbedding. In the real world, there are many variables that affect the formation of these bed forms. So naturally, they are far more diverse and complex than I've shown you thus far. Let's start by considering the structures that form when there is a unidirectional current or a flow of liquid or air moving in a single direction. Take current ripples and dunes, for example. When they first form, they start as straight crested ripples with relatively flat, inclined slip faces. These straight crested ripples are known for planar cross stratification. All of the cross laminae and cross beds lay in the same plane and dip in the same direction at a specific angle. However, if the flow velocity increases, or enough time simply passes, these straight crests mature as they migrate, first becoming sinuous or wavy in appearance. And then eventually, 
the structures become lingoid. Lingoid ripples and dunes are unconnected arcs. Rather than planar laminae or beds, these sinuous and lingoid structures develop trough-shaped cross stratification. But these structures are just the ones that form under unidirectional currents, currents moving in one direction. What happens when waves are responsible for the movement of sediment? Waves are also capable of producing ripples. However, waves tend to move sediment in two directions, like the tides that rise and fall up and down a beach. They are bi-directional. In bi-directional currents, sediment grains tend to roll and jump back and forth along the bottom as the flow oscillates over time. This pattern of sediment transport gives wave ripples a distinct form and a special kind of cross stratification. We call these symmetrical ripples. The cross laminae and symmetrical ripples dip in both directions within the same bed. Overall, current ripples tend to be sinuous and broken up into many short, unconnected crests. The ripples themselves are asymmetrical, and the laminae all dip in the same direction because they were deposited by a unidirectional flow. In contrast, wave ripples tend to be long and straight and only sometimes sinuous. Because they form from bidirectional flows, they are also called symmetrical ripples and have laminae that dip in multiple directions. As we wind down our tour of primary sedimentary structures, I want to leave you with one lasting message. The identification, recognition, and study of primary sedimentary structures is essential for understanding the transport and erosion of sediment in both modern and past depositional environments. Primary sedimentary structures are some of the best indicators of depositional environments and depositional systems. Be mindful of the fact that there is a lot more complexity to sedimentary structures than I've communicated here. Appreciating this complexity and embracing it are the first real steps in paleo-environmental reconstruction.